Good morning and welcome to Casino Baptist Church from lockdown. Welcome today and thank you for joining with me, Pastor Stephen Gord from Casino Baptist Church. And yes, up here in the Northern Rivers, we are in lockdown, which means sadly that we cannot physically meet together as a church. The church doors are closed. So to the church family, hopefully you are all watching this YouTube clip today. A big welcome to you, especially to those who may not join us online at least for 12 months since we had the first introduction to COVID last year. But to others who have been watching, not just from Casino, but from around New South Wales and Australia, a big welcome to you as well. This week, while we've been trying to work out all that's going on and what lockdown means for us, each day I've been praying. I've been praying for us as a church family. I've been praying for the people in the church. I have been praying for those in our region and across our state. But above all, one of the things that I have been praying is that I have trust. I have assurance that God is in control of all things. That this has not taken God by surprise. That he knows it all and we can trust that he will handle it. So that gives me confidence. Whether I can meet face to face with people at church, I would love to do that today. I love doing it every week, but I can't. But that's okay. We can connect online today. So as we think about coming together to look at God's word, how about I pray? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Lord, I do thank you that you are in control. Lord, I don't know another... 24, 48 hours, whether we're going to be able to come out of lockdown or not. But Lord, you know the answer to that and we trust you. We might think with the church doors closed that uh, that's a really bad thing and we're not sure what's going to happen there. But Lord, we still trust you. We can still connect online and connect in other ways. And we thank you for that opportunity. Lord, we have been truly blessed here on the Northern Rivers that this is our first real lockdown time. So, Father, we just offer it all up to you. We trust you. We offer our lives to you. And, Father, we know that you want us to share Jesus with people. You want us to live for you. Lord, help us to work out through your spirit how we can do that in the midst of this lockdown or in the midst of whatever changes might happen. So, Father, we just, as I said, offer ourselves up to you. And as we come to look at your word, we thank you that it tells us about your love for us. It tells us about how we need to respond to Jesus. And Lord, you tell us how you want us to live. So I ask that you'll help us to understand that today and that you'll give us the feet, the boldness to be able to go out and live it out. So Lord, as we come to look at your word now, open our eyes, prepare our hearts for it. So Lord, may we grow to be the people you want us to be. So, Lord, we offer this all up to you in your name today. Amen. Well, the last couple of weeks, we have been looking at foundational beliefs. The beliefs that as Christians, they would probably just roll off the tongue. We would say, we believe these things. Great. It's great that we believe these things. But what does that actually mean for our daily life? How do we actually live those beliefs out? How do we live it out? And we're going to continue today by looking at it. Last week, we touched on that we have created in God, that we as humanity are the pinnacle of creation, that in the order there is God, there is us, and then the rest of creation. We're there to care for creation and everything else. And above all, that we are made in the image of God. And when we looked at that, we saw how valuable we were. We saw the dignity that we had. And we saw God's love for us and all that that meant and how he wanted to relate to us. We know that when we looked at that last week, God looked at his creation. And after mankind, he didn't just say it was good. He said it was very good. And that's where we finished our belief last week. And my prayer this week, even with lockdown going on, is that you are able to understand a little bit more about what it means that you are made in the image of God and how that affects your daily life. You are valuable. You are worthy. And as we unpack,
unpacked scripture and we get to see all that that means and what God has done for us. Well, today we're going to look at a belief that flows directly out of the last one. And over the last few weeks, knowing that I was going to get to this message, I've been asking Christians and non-Christians what they thought of the world around us. Did they think that our world was perfect? Or did they think that our world was in a very good place? If you think of what we looked at last week in Genesis 1 and 2, the answer should be yes, it is very good, perfect. But it's not, is it? It's not at all. I mean, just look at this last week. We're in lockdown now. That's not very good. When you turn on your TV or the internet, we see wars, we see famine, we see slavery, we see um, governments doing the wrong thing, we see health issues, we see crime, we see drugs, we see COVID-19. We see other forms of violence that's out there. It's obvious that our world is not perfect. It's obvious that our world could be a better place. And each day we seem to hear uh, comments by people on how we can improve that. Get a new government. Throw more money at it. Fight another war over it. Cry over it. Write more articles about it. Educate people about it. Get the jab. And so on. But the problems remain. Why? Why is this world not very good? Why is this world not idyllic? Why is it not perfect? Why is our current world not the same as Genesis 1 and 2? Well, my answer to all of it, in summary, is the title for today's sermon. I say that we have this false belief that we know better than God a false belief that we know better than God. If you want to put it into a more religious sense, I want to talk about the fall or a more theological sense and probably really what our belief is today and that is that many of us, we would say we have a foundational belief in original sin or in a more biblical sense. Today, folks, we want to look at Genesis chapter 3. So if you've got your Bibles, flip right back to the beginning, jump the first two chapters where God created and everything was great, and then we hit Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 1 and 2, everything's great. Adam and Eve are in a great relationship together, and more importantly, with God. But something happens. Something happens in Genesis chapter 3. And I think the answer here in Genesis chapter 3 really tells us why, when we look at our world today, it does not look like Genesis 1 and 2. Verse 1 of Genesis chapter 3 starts this way. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The serpent was crafty. He didn't just jump out of the bushes and say, hey, let's not listen to God. Or he didn't just jump straight out and say, hey, God's got it wrong. He didn't say that. But as we unpack it, this crafty, sly creature leads Adam and Eve away from listening to God. And the first step is that he gets Eve, in verse 1, to start doubting God. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tr any tree in the garden. Did God really say? Now the serpent challenges Eve to doubt, to question what God has said and to question God's motives. I wonder if we sometimes hear something very similar today. I wonder if we sometimes hear people say, well, the Bible's got errors in it. And even just one little error, you may as well just throw out the whole lot. The whole lot is wrong. Or maybe we hear people say, oh, there are so many different translations today. They can't all be right. Therefore, they make the connection to be, if they can't all be right, they must all be wrong. 
Or maybe you'll hear people say, science. Science dispro disproves the Bible. Or what it can lead to is that when people start to doubt God, doubt God's word, doubt God's motive, is that they start to change God's word, add bits, leave bits out. I mean, in a way, that's what Eve does here. I mean, look at her response in verse 2 and 3 and see what she adds to God, God's word. Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. She's starting to doubt God. The serpent has put the thoughts in her mind that maybe God's got it wrong. So she starts to doubt. And when she's talking about the tree here, she adds the words, and you must not touch it. In a way, this is the beginning of the first lie that's ever told. Because God never said that. You're not just doubting or questioning exactly what God had said but also his motives. What the serpent is doing here, in a sly way, he is challenging Eve to tell her that God, God's a killjoy. That God doesn't want her to eat the beautiful fruit from that tree. Looks good, but you can't eat it. God's a killjoy. He's leading her down that path to doubting God's word and maybe even changing it. Now, today we hear statements, which I think are a little bit similar to that, where people might say, and hey, God is a God of love, isn't he? God wants what best for you, doesn't he? Well, therefore, if that's the case, God will be happy for you to do anything. God wouldn't say no to you. He wants you to be happy. Sound familiar? Sound like the serpent back in Genesis chapter 3? And this doubting God leads on to when people start to think that they actually know better than God. That's the false belief today. Knowing better than God. Look at verse 4. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. Serpent says very clearly, I know better than God. God says this. Ah, God's got wrong. It's not the case, says the serpent. You will not die. I'm telling you the real truth. And it just adds to this first lie that's in the Bible. And I wonder whether we can see this whole thought of knowing better than God actually creeps into our church and out of our church and our community more than we realise. And we start to hear people who will say things like, well, we know better than... They might not actually come out and say they know better than God, but they act like it. Now, knowing better than God, They'll say things like, God didn't really mean that some people will go to heaven and some people will go to hell. All people will be saved. See how it works? People start to think that they actually know better than God. Or for many of people in our world today, they think they know better than God because they very clearly say there is no God. Knowing better than God. Knowing better than God where... So, and this one's a big one sometimes in churches where people think, yeah, 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 God has said this, God has said that in his word, but you know what? I think I know better than God. I'm just going to live my way and God will be happy with that. Have I heard that? Where well, it might not come out and say, yeah, 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 we know better than God. By other things of what we say and how we live our lives, is that really what we're saying? So think about the serpent here. Sly, crafty, gets Eve to doubt, question God. He comes out and says, oh, no, actually, I know better than God. And he puts it before her. Now, what's her response going to be? You can see going down the slippery slope. In verse 6, she makes a choice, and Adam makes a choice, to disobey God. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Now, you could possibly, very little bit possibly, 
make the argument that Eve hadn't heard the exact words from God about the tree. But Adam did. Now, maybe we could say that Eve was tricked by the serpent, but Adam goes in with his eyes fully open and he chooses to deliberately disobey God. In other words, to sin. This is why I think, you know, in chapter 3, it's looking at this foundational belief of original sin. And many of us who say we love and follow Jesus, hopefully all of us, would say, yes, yes, that is our foundational belief. We know from last week we are created by God, made in the image of God, and the follow-on from that is we are all sinners. Genesis chapter 3 talks about the situation where sin comes into our world, original sin. So what is sin? Well, sin is, going back to what we're looking at, the belief that we know better than God. Now, D.A. Carson uh, puts it this way. It is de-godding God, removing God from the picture, elevating ourselves to think, Yes, yes, I can make all the decisions. I can make all the right ways of how I want to live my life. I can do it any way I want. Why? Because realistically, though I might not say the words, realistically, I'm going to live a life that says, I am God. To God in God. Not listening to him and elevating ourselves. And what does the Bible call that? Idolatry. And when we get down to the foundation of any sin, now go to the extreme of murder, or lust, or uh, whatever you want to get to, it all comes back to idolatry. It all comes back to we think we have this false belief that we know better than God. And friends and family, sin has consequences. At the end of Genesis 1 and 2, the beauty of being made in the image of God, and we talked about this last week, is that we can relate to each other and, more importantly, relate to God. As soon as sin enters the world, what happens? Relationships are broken. First of all, with God, you can see it clearly in verse 8 to 10. Instead of meeting with God and happily walking with God in the garden, Adam and Eve hide in shame because of the sin. The sad thing is, you know, when we sin today, it should actually drive us to God, not away, not to hide. But that's what Adam and Eve did. Their relationship with God was broken. But more than that, their relationship was also broken with each other. Now, I heard the funny joke during the week about a minister who wanted to work out whether the children in his church had really been listening to some of his messages. So he, he saw uh, a six-year-old girl just before church started one day, and he asked her, uh, do you know or did you know that Adam and Eve sinned? Her response, yes. The minister thought, great, they're actually listening to my messages. So he then went on and said, well, that's true. Well, what did God do to them because of their sin? The girl looked him straight in the eye, very clearly, very quickly, didn't even think about it. Her response was, he made them have kids. And then she walked away. What's, and look at Genesis chapter 3. You can see some similarities to her answer there. In verse 16 and 17, life is going to be difficult for Adam and Eve and the rest of humanity. They're going to be difficulties in how they relate to each other. And this is not how God made the world. This picture is no longer Genesis 1 and 2 where everything was very good. Now, sometimes people look at this and they say, oh, yes, yeah, Stephen, you believe in the Bible. You believe it's true. You believe in this story. Okay, we don't really believe it, but it's okay that you do. But here's the question, Stephen. Why then, after all these years, is our world still in such a bad place? It's a good question, isn't it? If all that happened a long time ago, why do we still have problems? 
Why is our world still not very good? Now, where they're going within the argument is to finally get to the conclusion, well, if God hasn't fixed the problem, maybe God can't, or if God hasn't fixed the problem, therefore why should we listen to God, or if God hasn't fixed the problem, maybe God doesn't exist at all. That's where they're going in that discussion. But they ask those questions. And I think the answer is, well, because from the moment we are born, we have this false belief. We are actually under the belief of the of original sin, which we're looking at today, the foundational belief, but we have, from the moment we are born, that false belief that we know better than God. We have this false belief that of idolatry. We have this false belief that says, yep, yeah, I'm God. We may not think, as I said earlier, use the words, but we sure live like it. Now, maybe you've heard people describe this situation of original sin and people still living this way as total depravity. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean, total depravity? Well, it does not mean that people are totally depraved. It doesn't mean that they are evil and beyond saving. But what it means is that all people, through every thought, every word, every deed from the moment they are born they are affected by sin affected because we decide or think that we know better than god and i think it's this sinful foundation why our world is still in such a bad place today as i said some people take it as a reason to you know not believe in god at all a reason to think that uh, if God could, surely he wouldn't leave the world the way it is. And what's interesting, and what I say to some of the people that have asked me that sort of question, is that you're partly right. God doesn't like the world the way it is. It's not the perfect world, Genesis 1 and 2. It's not the way he created it. It's not the way he was in a perfect relationship with humanity. He, it's not right. But also, where they are partly right, is God is not going to leave it this way. When you read the Bible, it's very clear that one day God is going to fix it. And that's the time when Jesus is going to return. We're going to have a new creation, new heavens, new earth. Everything will be perfect again. We're going to go back to the time of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. So how does God respond to our sin? In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve break their relationship with God. But all through, God keeps reaching out to them with grace and mercy. And throughout the whole Bible, God keeps reaching out to humanity. He's reaching out to you and to me with grace and mercy. Man hides, but God wants to save the relationship. God acts to save the relationship. In verse 9, we see him seeking out Adam. In verse 15, we get the beautiful promise, the great promise right from the very beginning. God created everything and it was good. Adam and Eve sinned. It is all broken. And instantly, out of grace, out of mercy, God says, I'm going to send a saviour. Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now we know that later in the Bible that we get to the story of Jesus, he is the saviour. He is the one that Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 is talking about. Right from the very beginning, God's plan was creation, relationship. We are made in his image. He knew that we would break that. He gave the opportunity, he gave free will to choose. Do you live God's way or not? Adam and Eve chose not. But right from the beginning, there was always the Saviour to come. And we know later on that it's Jesus and more about him in the weeks to come. Down in verse 21, we see the grace of God as he clothes Adam and Eve. Down again, verse 24, it's God's grace that actually removes them 
and his mercy that removes them from the garden. Because if they stayed in the garden in their sinful state and kept eating of the tree of life, they would live forever in that sinful condition and nothing could help them. So God kicks them out of the garden, puts the angel with the flaming sword there so they cannot re-enter it. It may look like God is punishing them, but God is doing it out of love, out of grace, out of mercy. And from chapter 3, we see it unfold through Scripture right down to us and into the future. The grace and mercy is still there. God just wants people to respond. Because when people say, ask that question, why would God leave the world in the not perfect way it is? Why would he leave it? Well, he's not going to. He's going to fix it. And when he fixes it, that means that time will run out for people to respond to him. We don't know when it's going to happen. But we know for certainty it will. So how will you, how will I respond to God in this situation? Knowing the belief of original sin, knowing that it hits and impacts every single human that's ever lived. How do we respond? Well, I think, first of all, we've got to be careful of the wrong way to respond, the wrong responses. And don't minimise sin. Now, any sin, small sin or big sin, it all upsets God because it reminds him of the broken relationship that we have. Don't legitimize sin. Now, don't just think that you can justify it. Sin is sin. All of it. Not one is better than another. It's all sin. Now, we're all sinners from the moment that we're born. As I said, those, the words earlier, we're totally depraved. So in that the situation, then we've got to realise that we cannot fix this problem ourselves. If sin is ingrained in us, original sin, it is, then we cannot fix the problem. We've got to trust in the one that can, which is God. And because we are all sinners, we cannot blame others for our sin. God is not going to hold you responsible or accountable for my sin. He's going to hold each of us accountable for our own sin and how we lived our lives. They're the wrong responses. We need to avoid those. The right response will be to realise that we need to come to, the, to God for forgiveness, that we cannot fix the problem. But great, the good news is we have Jesus. 2,000 years ago, dying on the cross. Why? Because he wanted us to have an opportunity to be forgiven. God gave us free will. We're all affected by original sin. Jesus died on the cross so that we could make a choice to be forgiven. Have you made that choice today? I know many of you have. And if that's the case that you have, do you realise that one day God is going to come back and fix creation. I think many of us, particularly in lockdown at the moment, would think, yes, that would be wonderful. God, come now. True. But if God came now, right now, I want you to think about people who do not follow Jesus. Maybe they're in your home right now with you. Maybe they're sitting across the couch from you. Maybe they're in your extended family. Maybe they're your neighbours, your workmates, your school friends. Do you realise the moment when God comes back to fix it all? Then for those people, it's too late. They cannot then respond to God. So that should encourage us to think, right, I'm looking forward to the day when God comes back. I want creation to be fixed. Everyone is affected by original sin. I need to share Jesus with them. So that through God's Spirit, I need to pray for them too, that God will change them and bring them to a point of wanting to follow him. We also need to realise that when we are saved from our sin, now when we give our lives to Jesus, it doesn't mean that we instantly stop sinning. We're still sinners. We're still affected by original sin. But what it means, though, is that it 
we, can, we are forgiven for our sin. It doesn't give us free license to go out and live any way we want and sin to we're all happy because we think, oh, yeah, we're forgiven. No, it doesn't work that way. But we can come to God and say, God, I'm sorry for that sin. Can you help me through your spirit to live the way you want us to live? And God will help us. And finally, a right response here is to be wary of this crafty serpent. Now we know that the serpent is Satan. And he is still crafty today. He is still attacking us today. We know at the cross that sin and death and Satan were defeated. We know with certainty the war is won ultimately. But the battle's still going. The battle for your soul is still going. The battle for your family is still going. Your friends, your neighbours, your schoolmates, your workmates, it's still going. And the devil would want us to go back to that false belief, to go back to thinking we know better than God and therefore make choices not to be with God. So today, what choices will you make? We have this foundational belief of original sin, the false belief that we know better than God, that we are God, idolatry. Today, have you fallen for that? Has the serpent been sly to you and has led you into questioning God? Maybe to start to wonder about God's word or God's motives? Maybe led you down the path where you're thinking about disobeying God? And if you've already gone down that path, it becomes easier and easier to disobey God next time and the next time. How far down that slippery slope have you gone? Because Genesis chapter 3, this belief of original sin, it should remind us that it is a tricky and slippery slope. But we can be saved. We can turn around and God will help us. So today, I know we're in lockdown up here and some of you would also be in lockdown around the state and maybe in other states as well. In the midst of lockdown, Take the time, take the moment, ask God's Spirit to reflect with you where you stand with Him. To reflect, are you actually knowing God the way God wants? Or has that lie, that false belief, crept into your life where you're thinking, yeah, I know better. The belief foundational belief of original sin. It affects all of us, but there is a cure. It is Jesus. Have you accepted that cure today? Let me pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the tough teaching in Genesis chapter 3 that we turned our backs on you. But Lord, we realise that when we were your enemies, when we thought we knew better than you, your own son went to the cross so we could be forgiven. Father, you've given us free will to make that choice. Father, what choice we make today, if we have not chosen to follow you, maybe we think we're too young, maybe we think we're going to live a bit, then make the choice. Lord, help us to understand that that is a choice and it's a choice to walk away from you. So, Father, there's only two choices. Two options, one choice. Lord, help us through your spirit to make the choice to love and follow you today. Father, as we go out to live, even in the midst of lockdown, Father, help us to understand what it means that all people are affected by sin and that all people need to hear about the cure for it. Lord, help us not to take the cure for granted. Help us not to take Jesus for granted, but share that good news with others. Lord, we thank you for your word today. In your name. Amen. Well, I do want to again thank you for joining with me today. In a couple of days, we'll find out whether we're going to stay in lockdown or not. My prayer is next week, 10 a.m., we'll be back physically together, Casino Baptist Church. But don't worry. 
These messages will still go up online for all those who can't attend for one reason or another. Also, remember our Casino Baptist Church Facebook page. You can send messages there, send questions, and then uh, every Wednesday evening, Kerry and myself try to get online, have a sort of a live session at 6.30 p.m. You can uh, come in and have a look at that. But also, if you've got questions, uh, hopefully we'll be able to answer some of them then. Or at least give an update on what's happening with COVID and a few other things in our town and particularly in our church family. May God bless you, may he watch over you and your family at this time. And during, whether it's lockdown or not, help us to listen to our governments, the government he has given us, and help us to follow the guidelines. May God bless you. See you next week.